Philip Gary would have been a seaman, you know, a merchant seaman. So he'd been away on the boats for maybe four or five, six months. My mummy was um, a doffing mistress. She worked in the mill. My dad was a roofer. My mother was a housewife. He, he was um, a baker's labourer. He was a docker. She was very loving, a very sensitive woman. He was a real funny man. He, everything was for her. We had uh, nine children. Great mother, that's what she was. <laughs> you couldn't get any better. And he had to give you change or give you money for running the shop for cigarettes or for uh, going to the bookies. Loved the kids. Loved taking the kids down to Daddy Christmas. We all loved him naturally and he, he just loved life and enjoyed life. <laughs> Life at that time was very hard for everyone. You, you had a whole series of events, um, like the, the likes of uh, the Falls Curfew in 1970, and then the likes of internment especially. In August 1971, which if you like traumatised the entire community, where hundreds of people were being arrested and interned. Oh, the place is in turmoil. You get bombs going off every day of the week, shootings, and you know, it, it was pretty chaotic for the, for, uh, the people of Belfast at the time. I got used to what it would call, people call the troubles. Uh, I worked in the post office doing driving. I did a delivery where in the mornings, you know, you went up what I would call up the shankle and down the falls. Shankle Road would have been clear. Driving down the falls had been littered with burnt out cars and lorries. I remember standing on the, on the lantern with my dad one night looking out the window with our two drawers, watching the boys putting the barricades up. It was all flagstones were using. And then the next thing there was this rattle of machine gun fire. And then all of a sudden there was nail bombs getting through. Basically that's how I came up. We started out troubles and all the force of it. A couple of days before the thing that the uh, news had just broken out, you know, that uh, the major uh, Republicans had escaped from Cromwell Jail, and that was a lot of activity at that point in time. But this was, you know, you took this as red because it wasn't unusual for to be stopped by the army and asked and put out again a wall to be searched. Didn't like it, but you sort of had to, you know, go along with that activity. And uh, the, it wasn't unusual for the area to be, you know, see a fair number of army vehicles, even in normal circumstances, driving about the town. And stuff like that, you know. So they never took a great deal of thing about because this was, you know, you nearly accepted normality was the army's going to be here for some time. I remember uh, that morning, my mother and father had been out shopping. It was coming near Christmas, so my mummy had said, "What about your Christmas clothes?" We and I says, "Ah, mummy, sure, we'll get them next week." And she says, "Now you never know what will happen by next week." That's every morning. We rolled up, we had our breakfast. My man and dad done their usual old thing. Uh, and then the next thing they said, they were away, they were away into the town. Because usually around their, their usual outspots, they basically probably, they probably will end up down Sailor's Town for to start off with and then work their way into the town. And then they usually call in the McGurk's Nile again. There was always something about that night that I'll never forget. I mean, it came to around about eight o'clock. And the place was in darkness and there was total silence. It used to be when you would have walked around a corner on the New Lodge Road, or any street in the New Lodge Road, you would have walked into um, a foot patrol. There, there was nothing, you know, it was, the silence was deafening. It was, 
You heard your footsteps as you were walking down the street. In them days, there wasn't anything like Tesco's or Asda. So the shopping was done at your corner shop. So what they did every Saturday night, they would have went down to Lizzie's. They went into Lizzie's and there was a woman being served. And um, my... Lizzie apparently had said to my mommy and daddy, give me a few minutes and we'll get your stuff ready. And my mommy says, no, we'll not. We'll go on in here, sure. By the time you've got them ready, we'll have finished and we'll be back again. So my daddy says they didn't wait that night. They went on into the McGurks. And then that was it, of course. Well, I was upstairs in the bedroom um, when I heard the explosion. That's really shut the house, and I mean shut the house. I'd, you might as well say that it literally shut the whole the, the, uh, new lodge and all. And I can remember going, opening the window, um, and sitting on the bay window, and let, after the explosion went off, had no clue, you know what I mean, no inclination about anything. So I went out to the front door, seen people running about, running about everywhere, and then suddenly started shouting, McGurk's, McGurk's, McGurk's cabin. We saw the smoke arising, so we automatically made our way down. I went down the new lodge, brick wall, and the next thing I seen was complete chaos. As I got near, it was a hill, a, a, you mean a hill of people. It was just one complete pile of rubble with hundreds of people on top of it trying to tear it apart to save people. And there was, they were passing out the rubble one by one. Some, somebody shouting through a halo, anybody from the docks, anybody from the docks. And you know, and the next thing was there was shouting, there's one here, there's, here's one. Oh, there's one over here, I've got another one. And that was it. I didn't even know no more if I was in it. My Uncle Terry, he was called away by a woman coming up the street. What I didn't know at that time was the woman was telling them that they had pulled my mommy and my daddy out of the rubble. But that's my regulation of that night. And uh, from that night, that was my life way down. We were watching the football highlights when the programme was interrupted and it says that uh, we interrupt this programme for a special news bulletin about the casualties of McGurk's Bar and then a list of names started appearing on the television screen and that's when my mother started screaming and that's when my father jumped up out of his seat because that was the first time we seen Philip Gary's name coming up on a television screen. And that was the first time he even realised that he was dead. Her mum come up on early Sunday morning and told us the news. Uh, she, she, she could have maybe been up a bit earlier, but because she knew Margaret was expecting within a few weeks' time, a number of weeks, didn't want to do any excitement because basically we couldn't have do, done anything. He was, he was dead. I was away and uh, Bobby was murdered on Saturday night that happened and I didn't find out to Monday. The Brewers actually went around the hospitals and the morgues back and forth and back and forth. Nobody told them anything in the morgues, nobody told them anything in the hospitals. People in the morgue had taken a set of keys from, from the pocket of this dead person and it was my, uh, it was actually my Uncle Bobby who was the Protestant from Protestant and uh, he left the morgue with a set of keys went back to Stanhope Drive, you know, to the house, and it was only when he put the key in the door and the door opened that they realised that the body in the morgue was actually my grandfather. It was my brother-in-law. I went and then to find the body, and um, it was very hard for him too. And it was worse on the family when they were told how he was, you know. Uh, I know my, my father was born in I. I know he was on the land beside the gas line and he was actually born. Uh, my, mother's for, or my mother's face was supposed to be badly done with the, uh, the rubble. 
it was always sticks in my mind that I was able to identify him okay, facial wise. And I don't want, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the, uh, but what I'd seen in the morgue is not like you'd see on TV. Uh, it was a very dark, black room. Uh, there was uh, obviously things sitting about where there was looked to be obviously parts of bodies, not a whole like you know sitting on the floor on stretchers and stuff like that. And uh, the uh, I found that difficult. You know that uh, there was obviously th things had been recovered. Uh, it looks to be, you know, I was saying to myself, those people, like I was lucky to a degree that I was able to identify them without any much difficulty. And uh, it always stuck in my head afterwards that uh, I'd asked the director, uh, the funeral undertaker, to do certain things. He says that would be no bother. And his coffin and one other coffin were the only coffins of the 15 people that were open, able to people to come in at a wake and come in and view him and one of the wee boys, you know. So the, we had that sort of, at least some really, that way we could be with him, if you understand. I mean, people had, what I call it, the remains of their family in a box, which they couldn't see, which I thought would have been very, very difficult for all our families, you know, too. Not once did, did a policeman, not once did a, a professional counsellor or trained counsellor um, even come anywhere near us. The police didn't even come to the door. They only got the guts to come to the door. They only got the decency to come to the door to tell, to tell anybody where anybody was or, any, or what was happening to anybody. I was actually a friend of the families that identified my father. And then that's how we knew. My daddy was in a room in his own. And my uncle Jim had to tell him that my mommy was dead. And I remember him crying. And that was the first time ever that I'd seen sadness or a man cry, you know. And he signed himself out. Because, I mean, he was very badly injured himself. He'd cut some bruises and his body had been burned, you know. One of the brothers noticed that I had the wrong body. Oh. And it wasn't my father. And the simple reason why he knew that because he insisted on having my father's coffin open. And when it was open, he recognised my, my father's wee finger. Because my father lost his finger years and years ago in the dax. And he knows the other person's finger was fully there. So Mickey Kane's body came to our house. And my father's body went to Kane's house. And you know yourself, at Belfast at that time, getting from uh, North Belfast to West Belfast, you know, it was pretty chaotic. We eventually got there, with the help of nobody else. No cops, no undertakers, no, no this, no that. Uh, I'm near sure the undertakers were involved, but I knew nothing about it. But as I say, we ended up getting the body sorted out. And that was a big knock in the face too, you know. You know through that sort of thing. And the coffin came in, and my daddy says about the lid, but they wouldn't lift the lid off because my mother as you know she was burnt alive and just as they set the coffin down the army came in straight into the door demanding that the coffin lid be lifted open because they were searching for guns and ammunition they had went round the whole area at the night of the bombing and they had searched people's homes the people of those that were killed they were trying to link someone that had been killed in the bomb to the IRA in order to prove that it was the IRA that done it. And I remember my father slowly and quietly getting up from the chair. He had been sitting in the chair at the corner and he spoke to the army officer. The army officer went into the hall, went through the radio, came in again and saluted my father and turned to the army and says, we're leaving now. My daddy during the war was uh, a colour sergeant in the Royal Irish Fusiliers. So the next day then they came back with a reeve to my daddy. There was a Welsh regiment, I think a Royal Regiment of Fusiliers or something, but they would have been mostly Catholics, funny enough. And at one point, they had actually came to the door of the wake house um, and said how sorry they were to my, my grandmother and, and whatever. And um, they came in and basically paid their respects. 
which is something, you know what I mean, unique, something you, you, you wouldn't have seen or wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have heard of um, years later. But that was something, that was something, uh, a humanitarian gesture on behalf of some of the, the soldiers who would have been in, in the district um, at that time. They started burying them, you know, two and three, you know, two, two or three funerals in the morning, two or three in the afternoon. There was crowds, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crowds, right, like from the new lodge right up to four years old. A massive turnout. Put his down, uh, Lava Street, and then down the new lodge old, and along Larkin Street. Long Kerry killed Millfield and walked the whole way to Milltown Cemetery, you know. There was a few, now I'm not saying all, Caps gave a final salute. There was two or three, and I would say those two or three caps would have been old timers who knew the people that were from Sellers Town, what have you know. Can you imagine getting towards the bottom of the shankle, and there's hundreds of men, nay, not children, men and women and they have Union Jacks, and they have Ulster flags, and they have all sorts of, uh, and they're screaming and they're shouting. When the corpse was going over, the other side of religion, they were singing and dancing, which made pretty bad for my parents and all of us. There was a song in the pop charts at the time called Bits and Pieces. You know, it was a, a hit in the pop charts in 1971. Each time at any funeral went across Peter Silla, Lower Shankle, they got the same treatment. Men and women, and they were singing bits and pieces about my grandfather. Because 15 people are now dead, I could only believe come out and sing a song like that. That has stuck with me and stayed with me uh, for, for 40 years or more. You know, it's had a profound impact on, on my life then. You know. It was the, one of the, the, the biggest explosions in the loss of life in Northern Ireland at that time. I had said to myself, you know, if people seen what I seen down in the morgue, there'd be no more bombings. And always, when we were walking up the Falls Road uh, behind a funeral, we'd heard a bomb go off, and I just said, well, so much for that thought that I had, there'd be no more bombings, you know, so. The one thing that sticks and stuck in my head ever since was the radio broadcast on the Sunday morning, on Sunday, when uh, the bulletins gave out, you know, that uh, this a bomb explosion. It was an IRA on goal. And within 12 hours, the senior um, RUC inspectors on the scene, they had to, they had to write up a report called the duty officer's report. Um, and basically they started telling lies. They started in this report saying that um, the bomb exploded. It was brought to the bar by a known member of the provisional IRA to be collected by another known member of the provisional IRA to be taken to you know, somewhere else. And the bomb had exploded prematurely inside the bar. Where did all that come from? These stories were given out by Thiefville Barracks over in Lisburn. They were told, they were given statements out by the police and by the army and that was it. So rather than go and investigate it, they were just given what to write and that was it. Well, the very first talk was they were making a bomb inside. And those who were inside knew what was going on, so they were all classed as bombers. If you get a statement from the RUC headquarters, that's what the, the journalist, it was, it was lazy shoddy journalism and in a way they were colluding with the state and just instead of instead of trying to do their own investigative journalism. The following morning the RUC put this disinformation into black and white and from our archive research this is where the disinformation began. This is where the black propaganda emanated from. 
the story that was put out that it was an IRA goal, well, that was it. We were IRA, we were Republicans, we were terrorists. They caused it to themselves, they don't deserve anything. You have eyewitnesses reports, literally from, from within ours. Um, if you go back to the RTE um, recordings at the time, there's actually a statement from a young boy who was a newspaper boy. And he actually seen the car pulling up. Um, he sees the man getting out, going over, lighting the package and running back to the car. And then the car driving off. And as it drove past him, he actually saw the Union Jack sticker on the back um, of the car. So he's given this evidence to the RTE and was then given it to, to the police. But instead of accepting that evidence, um, plus the evidence of other eyewitnesses who witnessed the, the, the actual bombing itself, instead of accepting that, the police just concentrated on this fictitious idea that it was a so-called own goal, which was a, a heinous term to, to describe any, any atrocity, but I mean, that's what they kept calling it, an IRA on goal. 14 years of age, I was wondering. I, I didn't know who to believe. I, did, I didn't know what to believe, you know. Um, listening to my father and that, I mean, yes, they knew. My father was saying there was nobody in the bar. We weren't doing anything. They were sitting there. He remembers. He talked about his smell and all that there. I mean, my father was telling the truth. I'm sure that pub, Paddy McGurk Ron, was, was uh, he wouldn't even let a curse in it. And that went for everybody. You know what I mean? Um, there was no no politics. They actually, they are used to eat drunk in the pub. You know what I mean? There was a, 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 a barracks there called Glen Lowell Street Barracks. And uh, they are used to would call in and have a drink. That's the sort of pub Paddy McGurk run. McGurk's was a Christian boy, you may as well say. Paddy McGurk was uh, a real good man. Didn't allow any cursing. He called anybody cursing at the square back side. <laughs> Making him put money on it. Paddy McGurk, I always remember. Black and white television set, you know, with the thing, and coming on the television said that not only did he pray for the people who had been killed and injured, he prayed for the people that planted the bomb. And that, you know, you couldn't get any better Christianity attitude about things. When, when he had lost his wife, his, his daughter, his business, he had been injured himself, his business had been wrecked, and he's coming out with a statement like that within a very short period after the bomb had happened. I, I just found that, you know, very uplifting that he could do that, you know. So he had three senior RUC inspectors basically fabricating the story. And that's, that was the initial lie about the bomb. And then as the days went on, it grew legs. Do you know what I mean? Brian Faulkner brought it to, when he had to go to London to explain what was happening, he then takes the lie with him. Um, on the Monday, uh, and they, this isn't me talking uh, uh, in that sense. We now have official government documents that are stamped um, private confidential, but under the 30-year rule or the 40-year rule, in this case, we have got, the families have got access to them. So we can prove categorically that the Prime Minister of the time starts embellishing the story, and even at one point in his account, his written account, of we have the minutes of the meeting with the British Home Secretary, he starts to say that he, as Prime Minister, has now instructed the RUC not to investigate the bombers, but to put their time and energy in the investigating the families to see if any of them have got IRA sympathies or if they got IRA connections. So he's actually interfering in the most, the biggest mass murder of people in the history of the Sixth County State.
On the 16th of December, 1971, less than two weeks after the bombing, the RUC Chief Constable, during the Joint Security Committee meeting, stood in front of the Northern Ireland Prime Minister, the Minister of State for Home Affairs, and the General Officer Command of the British Forces in the North at that time, and told them directly that two of our family members were known IRA terrorists. This, of course, was a blatant lie and has never been substantiated in any evidence that has been presented to us by the HET or the Police Ombudsman. Within six or seven hours after that bomb went off, you know, and they kept this up, and they spread them lies all around the world. And then the next day you have the John Taylor, who was Minister for Home Affairs. He stands up in, in, in Stormy Parliament and says basically what he was, the, the same lie that he's been fed um, previously by the RUC. And then the British Army, in their reports, you know, um, they, you call them sit reps or situation reports. We have a number of them for the, the 6th and the 14th, where they're actually expanding that, over the, that five of the people um, who were killed in the bar, we now know that they must have been standing around it. So they're trying to give this impression of five people standing around a bomb i.e. as if they were manufacturing it and it exploded and they were saying oh the forensic evidence now proves that uh, the bomb was inside the bar and it was being made by the people inside the bar the forensic reports weren't even made public until february 1972 so this is you know what i mean in the days after the explosion all these people start concocting these these stories. When I heard the statement a couple of days later about young McCrory, the young uh, newspaper boy, seeing someone at the bar, and I said, now, that sounds more like what had happened. And the interview, he had done an interview with RTE very shortly, but, you know, afterwards. And when I seen the thing about the interview, you know, that I said, well, that seems more like what had happened. Uh, and it wasn't long afterwards when we were starting to get my thoughts together about how this all happened, I realised, you know, this wasn't meant for McGurk's. If this was the guys wanting to plant a bomb, then one of them been wanting to hit was the gym. And the propaganda had been ready and set when the bomb went off and the propaganda would all come in, bang, 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 it was an IRA unit, except an IRA bomb. Even, even when he started to get the forensics and, and the forensics was starting to prove that the, the families weren't, in other words, that some of the people whose, whose bodily injuries included shrapnel, shrapnel wounds of wood. In other words, there was a door between them and the bomb and then the bomb exploded, blew the door apart and then they were getting shreds of wood. Um, as part of their injuries. And in fact, my father-in-law and a couple of others had wooden splinters in their back, which sort of proved they were, there was a wooden structure between them and the bomb. All that would have told you that the bomb was outside, do you understand? It's, that was never brought up. In fact, it was repressed when it came to the, the, the inquest. Now, what we didn't know at the time, which we subsequently found out, and I was really miffed about this point, was that they had got other forensic reports as well, not only Dr. Hall's report, they had got other reports about the clothing of the, the injured and the people who were killed, and not, not all the forensic of their clothing showed not one of them had any sort of atom of near a bomb itself. We've seen the paperwork. They had that information weeks before the inquest, yet they didn't release it. They didn't mention it at the inquest, and that would have shown clearly, confirmed along with the, the forensic, you know, pathology, his report, that the bomb was planted by others. Yet they didn't do that. And I couldn't take it in. That here was the people who were supposed to uphold the law, 
supposed to be looking after the law. I can understand people making mistakes and doing things, but deliberately holding information back in connection with that there, which would have cleared the whole matter at that point in time, and they didn't do that. And that still kept on and on and on, even after Robert Campbell was, was convicted. In July 1977, Robert James Campbell was arrested for terrorist activity and during uh, questioning by police, which didn't seem too heavy, I hasten to add, um, he admitted that he was in the car that had bombed McGurk's Bar in 1971. He also admitted to planning the killing of John Morrow, a Protestant worker who had been driving a, a, a van in West Belfast whenever it was attacked by his platoon. Um, Mr Morrow saved the lives of, of many people in the back who happened to be Catholics, uh, but he himself was killed. And we were told, and, and, and one of Faisley, that he was told to get himself up because he killed the person instead of a Catholic. In March 1976, the head of the CID in Belfast was given a list of five names of five UVF people who were, who were believed to be responsible for McGurk's. So a year later, when Robert James Campbell was arrested for something else, but admitted to being you know, responsible for McGurk's or being part of the team. If you go back and look at the original list, do you understand? His name is at the top of it. So if his name's true out of the five names, what do you think you should do with the other four names? Do you understand? At the very least, you would think you should be arrested and questioned. You don't have to be an expert on any of this, but you'd think you'd arrest and put them in the four separate rooms and say, look, Campbell squealed like a pig and he's named Hughes. But they weren't even arrested, not even till this day. The confession that he made they were sitting in this car waiting. They wanted to plant the bomb at the gem bar, but they couldn't because there was men, there was always somebody standing outside the gem bar. So it came to about 29. They'd been sitting there from 8 o'clock. So it came to about, say, about 25 to 28. They realised, they were told they were to deliver that bomb and they were not to come back unless it was delivered. No. So they knew they had to get rid of it. They couldn't sit any longer because the bomb could have been sweating itself, the gel ignite. So they drove up and they turned left and the next pub they came to was McGurk's Bar. That they, they, they didn't want to admit that, that McGurk's was, was um, an atrocity committed by loyalists because, don't forget, internment was in its infancy. The, the state was fighting the IRA, was arresting and interning Catholics, Nationalist Republicans. So for them is to admit that the UVF had just murdered 15 men, women and children would have forced a rethink and would have forced the state to start arresting Protestants. In other words, UVF, UDA, um, terrorists and putting them in jail as well. So rather than have to face that, that um, appalled vista, as someone else would have, would have says, that instead of re accepting that reality, they buried it. And the same as they tried to bury our families and blame them for something that they didn't do. There was a policy in place at that time entitled Arrest Policy for Protestants, which dictated Protestants and Protestant extremists were not to be interned, and they were not interned until 1973. This, this uh, stigma was still attached to our families, that they were part and parcel of a bombing thing. People were, were, were um, didn't really know, did, I mean, was it a bomb planted by loyalists? So I think it was always that suspicion that, um, especially because it was coming from government sources and, and the media and the British Army and the police and politicians. The community had a certain reservation in connection with whether, you know, uh, there was some truth to the, the 
propaganda that was going out or not. Because for some years afterwards, people, certain people would not have talked to other people because they felt that, that this was true. If they had done a proper investigation at the start, um, and they had been seen to be impartial, in other words, not being anti-Catholic, not being anti-nationalist, that you could have had a situation where a lot of people would have started to give more faith and more confidence towards the powers of the state. But instead, you felt alienated, you felt aggrieved, you felt um, pushed away, you felt um, unheard. No counselling came towards us at all. We weren't offered anything whatsoever. Nobody. The only thing we had was our friends and family and our neighbours. As my mother said, it was through prayer and that she ever was able to cope. I'm my dad. I think down the years that there was no formal structures for, for any sort of um, professional counselling or professional health. And basically they were just told to get on with it, you know what I mean, and um, make do. Oh, yes, there was always a bitterness. Um, I mean, it was the deaths that they all got, but it, it never goes away, never goes away, you know? And you just have to try and carry on, which is hard. I mean, it's 40 years now and still it's going on. But it was a lot of weeks afterwards, I remember getting up to use the bathroom and I heard Cran. Now my granny, we lived with my granny at the time, my daddy's mummy. We always lived with her. And my daddy was crying and she was actually cradling him in her arms. And that's all right. I mean, remember, that was her baby. You know, that was her baby. And he was saying, but it's my fault. I should have made her stay in the shop. I should have made her stay in the shop. He says, and then he says, I couldn't help them. He could this, this was a man that was lying underneath a collapsed building. But he was guilty. He was guilty because she wanted to go from the shop into the pub. He was guilty because he couldn't get her out. He couldn't get... He kept pushing the rubble from him, he told McGrath. He kept pushing it. And I, he couldn't help Mr and Mrs Keenan. He was guilty. And he was guilty because he was the only one out of the four of them left alive. My father would have sat in a chair. He had the one chair that he sat on. And he had a dozed off. My daddy would have been sitting there pushing, going like this and this and doing that. And it wasn't actually until he died... He, every time he closed, he said, he was under the, he was trying to push the rubble away from him, you know. He, he closed his eyes, that was it. It all came alive to him again. The bomb exploded. Our campaign for truth started. My peers, uh, the other family members, have campaigned tirelessly and relentlessly for four decades now to try and clear the name of their loved ones. They, it is a campaign they have waged with dignity uh, and constitutionally as well, it should be said. Aside from going and knocking on doors of politicians, uh, letter writing, um, going to speak in to other campaigning groups, we have had to spend most of our time uh, going through public records, through military documents, through freedom of information in order to try for ourselves to source the truth that has been left to us and our great friends in the Pathfinder Centre and British Irish Rights Watch to do this. We're now into a, a generational thing. I mean, my grandmother has died, my mother has passed on and my elder sister, who would have been involved and, and took a, a keen interest in the campaign. She has died. So that's just our family. You replicate that across the other families. And you can actually see now at some of the meetings, the family, McGurk's family meetings, that you're now having grandchildren coming to the table. Do you know what I mean? They're sort of coming, they, they want to learn more, they want to become, what, what can we do um, to help? And it was especially noticeable there for the 40th anniversary on the 4th of December last, where young children, in other words, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of, of the McGurk's Bar um, 
um, people who were, were murdered, they came forward and they helped. You know, we had this project to recreate the bar, to put the bar, the facade of the bar back in place the way it was, and they were actively involved. So you can see it's coming down through the generations, because 40 years has taken a terrible toll physically um, and emotionally and psychologically on the families. But you're getting, you're getting inspiration by the fact that there's other ones prepared to take up the mantle and are prepared to step forward and say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll take the torch now and we'll follow, we'll follow it forward. I'm not an educated person, to tell you the truth, because my younger days, after my mother and father were killed, I never really went to school. But I've done wee bits and pieces here and there. I've been in the Bolton game and I know a wee bit about the Bolton game and now I'm a lorry driver. And I've worked my way up. I've worked hard for it. I've worked on all sorts of bad wires. But with this campaign, it's opened my eyes big time of what's actually going behind doors, closed doors. The lies is actually going on. I never grieved for my mother until this last lot of years, I would be honest with you, until I really got in to the research of the McGurk Spire bombing. We now have had two reports by the historical inquiries team, and we've now had two reports by the police ombudsman's office, but the state, in the form, of, in this case, in the form of, of the chief constable, who wasn't even here in 1971, he can't bring himself to admit that what the RUC did in 1971 was wrong. Well, that's just another stab, it's another knife through the heart. We got the Ombudsman's report, the second Ombudsman's report, um, and basically the families felt vindicated. Here at last was, was an official government report that says that the RUC was wrong. They didn't use the word collusion, which we objected to, but they did use the term investigative bias in terms of the RUC, you know, concentrating solely on the own goal theory and not even taking into account the possibility that the loyalists may have been responsible, that that led to investigative bias on the part of the RUC. So we felt vindicated, we came out and we said that to the media, almost within two hours or, or whatever, the RUC in the form of the Chief Constable, or PSNI, sorry, in the form of, 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 of Matt Baggett, had issued three separate statements saying that, in their opinion, they weren't accepting the report. When we got the documentation from the RUC of their archives and stuff like that there, there's certain information destroyed or can't be found or no trace of, you know, disappears. But the British Army... They keep everything, you know, uh, and this is amazing because if we can actually, tr we've tracked the stuff down, but the stuff that we were looking for from particularly the RUC seems to have gone walkies, you know, not, can't be found. Documents, letters that we, they had written to the uh, pathologist and stuff like that there. We got the pathologist letter, the RUC letter, can't be traced. The information that connects with some of the information there, witnesses about cross telephone lines, Documentation, which is witnesses' reports, all you see, can't be traced. Strange. Or you see people who are now being asked to investigate the wrongdoings of other, or you see people, or other Spice and Brands people um, 40 years ago. And to me, that's, that's, that's nonsense. You can't have the police investigating the police. And it's the same with the Ombudsman's Office. We, at the start, had more faith in the Ombudsman's Office than we did in the HET. But now it has proven that there's even people within the, the, the Ombudsman's Office who are acting as gatekeepers, and they, they're dictating, you mean, like words like collusion can't uh, and, and won't be used, that these people are dictating how reports, in other words, Reports are being written by the, by the Ombudsman's office, and instead of being made public, are then being rewritten to suit at the agenda of the old guard.
it's indefensible. You cannot defend it. And, and for us, to blame the wrong organisation for 40 years and to cover up what they did for 40 years, it was wrong. Why is there flaws here and flaws are? What have, what have they got to hate? And a simple apology, that was all we asked for in the first place. And they wouldn't have to go through all this. Personally, I believe there was collusion um, between the state, but in other words, between the British Army, uh, particularly military intelligence, uh, and the bombers. It's hard, it has been hard to prove conclusively, but then you need to be clear um, about your definition of collusion. What what involves collusion? I mean, is it, you know, the British Army supplying these people with weapons and explosives? No, in my opinion. But collusion, uh, that, I mean, that is collusion, but collusion can also mean after the event, you know, withholding information and deliberately setting up a false narrative. In other words, giving these people an alibi, giving these people a story. That, oh, no, that's basically what happened. We believe, right, there's somebody good there that has to come out to tell the truth. Somebody in there has to do So this is our way of going down this road and seeing if they can help us. I am more convinced now that the, the McGurk's families on their own aren't strong enough, that we need the, the active support and the active help of other families, of other campaigns, of other individuals, who can all come together and say to the state, you need to, you need to resolve this issue, or else we're going to end up in court for the next 20 years. You know, separate cases, separate families, taking individual court action, taking individual prosecutions, taking individual civil action. So, to find, this is, to me, this is the last unresolved issue. We solved the policing, by and large, we, we solved the idea of people working together in Parliament together. But this is it. The big one that is, is hard to deal with the legacy of the past. Until we get some sort of international independent um, body to deal with this, it's still going to drag on. And those with a vested interest that the, that the truth doesn't come out are still going to dig in their heels and still going to refuse the families access to the documentation and access to, to what is required for them to, to get closure. I don't think the politicians care about the, the victims. In the old days, when people were a bit murdered by both sides, they were the first ones to jump on the bomb wagon to glorify themselves. But now, when the victims are asking for help, they don't want to know. That's across all parties. Nobody thinks about the survivors of the shootings, the survivors of the bombers, the bombings. Nobody thinks of them. I'm glad to see people sitting in powers nowadays where they're safe. The way things are nowadays, to me, is I can't go on with my future. And a lot of people would say to me, why don't you forget about it? You know, it's gone, it's, it, it's dusted, forget about it. You know, people just want to throw it aside. But our past is our history, you know, and our past is our future. There's something, if you like, is unfinished business. You would like um, to go away and be able to do something else with your life but there's something you just feel compelled that um, the dead cannot speak um, and we have to try and speak for them and be their voice. 
and try and act on their behalf to say that these people were innocent and that these people deserve justice? Everybody's entitled to know the truth. No matter what, Catholic, Protestant or various different nationalities have been killed in these in troubles too, you know what I mean? Everybody's entitled to know the truth or how their loved ones was murdered and who was responsible for them. My grandmother, um, she would always say that she never wanted the prosecutions. She never wanted to see people go to jail. All she wanted was someone to come and say that her, her husband, Phil Gary, uh, was innocent. He was just an ordinary Catholic who went out that night for a pint of Guinness and was killed, that he wasn't a bomber. That, that was the only thing that we wanted, was a simple apology and for our loved ones' names to be vindicated. To have their innocence put back because their innocence was taken away by an authority that was supposed to be able to protect them. They were all innocent people and just to get justice for them and clear their name, you know? That's what just people want now. I just want the truth. I'm not wanting the people to go to court and get hung and done, etc, etc. All I want is the truth to come out and admit the truth publicly. I would be happy with the truth because that's what we've been fighting for all these years, the truth. Our contention always was that the truth costs nothing. It's the inquiries cost millions. Best closure for us is for the state uh, in the form of the of the police and the army and the government they admit finally and publicly to the world that what happened um, in 1971 it wasn't our families that were, was to blame it was the UVF and then on top of that it was compounded by the statements and the actions of, of, of senior RUC um, British army and British government ministers. I think society out here is just turn around and say Right, it's time to ask what's going on here. The truth has to be told and that's it. If these people can't go on with the past, then we can't go on with our future either because the past is always going to come up no matter what. Well, I'd like people out there to come out and say, right, let's get these people together, to ask them what they need, to give them a forum to speak, to be able to tell their story so that everybody, so that the likes of the government, politicians, everybody come out and say, these people have suffered and they are still suffering. We need to get the truth out to these people. We need to make sure that this never happens again in this society. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this short seminar and thank you very much to Fela and Fubbel for supporting our family campaign over the years and for giving me this platform to engage with your good selves. My name is Kieran McArch. I'm the grandson of John and Kathleen Irvine, two of the many victims of the McGurk's Bar Massacre of 4th of December 1971. My grandmother Kathleen was one of 15 civilians who were murdered that night. Among the dead were two children. My grandfather John was very lucky to escape with his life, but he escaped badly injured and he suffered many years thereafter, along with the other survivors too. At that time in our history in the north of Ireland, the McGurk's Bar Massacre was the single greatest loss of civilian life in any murderous attack since the Nazi Blitz of Belfast a generation before. Pro-state British extremists had bombed the pub. A young newspaper boy saw them do it and saw them escape in a car. All of the evidence, including other witness testimony, proved that the bomb had been placed in a doorway outside the bar and the bar was attacked. Nevertheless, before we buried our loved ones, the British state buried the truth. In a massive disinformation campaign involving the RUC police force, the British Army, the British Intelligence Services, and both governments at Stormont and Westminster, the British state conspired to blame the McGurk's Bar bombing on the innocent victims in the bar. In doing so, they criminalised innocent civilians, including my grandparents, and they allowed the true perpetrators go free. And those perpetrators ended up killing many more civilians. I'm also author of the book, The McGurk's Bar Bombing, and founder of the charity Paper Trail, which is funded by Peace4 and Victims and Survivors Service to offer free advocacy support and legacy archive research to victims and survivors of the conflict. So I will bring you up to date with some of the battles that we have had to fight since the publication of the book in 2012. 
I will also discuss some of the discoveries that we have made during this period and publish some startling new evidence of state cover-up and collusion. I also aim to name the person whose dirty fingerprints are all over the heinous McGurk's bar lie. In my book I published a raft of critical new evidence from British archives which proved the innocence of the victims and tracked the flow of disinformation back to the police. I proved that the Chief Constable at the time and head of RUC Special Branch deliberately lied to and misled the governments of Northern Ireland and Britain, and indeed the General Officer Command in the British Army in the North. The police lied that two of the victims were members of the Irish Republican Army and that a bomb that they were carrying exploded prematurely. But I also proved that the same General Officer Command had been informed by a British Army bomb expert within 12 hours of the attack that the bomb had been placed outside. So they knew fine rightly that our loved ones were innocent. They had no foundation for their lies and they still don't. I examined reasons how and why the British state would manufacture such horrific lies, which took in an examination of British counterinsurgency and one General Sir Frank Kitson, a British military strategist of repute and brigadier in charge of the British Army in Belfast at the time of the explosion. To some members of our community he is a military hero and to others a director of terrorism. In 93, he is alive today. In simple terms, basic tenets of his counterinsurgency policies are information and contact, which led me to include new evidence of the formation of information units during his tenure, which controlled army PR, propaganda, psyops and disinformation under the umbrella of British information policy. I also examined the development of the military reaction force, a covert extra-legal British special force unit which ran surveillance, gathered intelligence, ran agents, and killed civilians. By the time of the book's publication in 2012, direct reference to Brigadier Frank Kitson, his covert units, and the McGurk's Bar Massacre was elusive. I knew where that information might be, but of course, I wasn't getting any help from either the British Ministry of Defence or the British Historical Investigation units that were in place in the North at that time. I'd even tracked down a former leader of the military reaction force, retired Brigadier James Alistair McGregor, to his home in Kent and to his workplace in London in 2010. He obviously didn't want to initiate contact either. Nevertheless, I thought it was important to lay down a marker in my book because this was the direction of travel for the research. Many of our families, including myself, believed that the British Army and British intelligence services had foreknowledge of the attack and could have prevented it. I believe we proved collusion after the fact, but collusion prior to the explosion was always going to be difficult to prove. Again, I know where information confirmant or denying that will be, but the British state will battle me for it at every single turn. In 2011, the Office of the Police Ombudsman had shamefully disagreed. It found investigative bias against the police but stopped short of collusion. In doing so, the police ombudsman moved his own goalposts of what amounted to collusion and what he used for a finding of collusion at the same time regarding the cloudy atrocity. The Chief Constable of PSNI, Matt Baggett, within hours denied even this central finding. His successor, though, had to rule over and accept this finding during one of our many court battles against the police. And we have been in court continually since then, trying to access information and seek a proper investigation. We had to judicially review the police to get access to the historic inquiry team's report into the McGurk's Bar atrocity, as the HET wouldn't hand it over. When we got to the fourth or fifth version of the HET report, we lost count. It was nonsense as expected, so we have been embroiled in a judicial review to get it quashed. So, as expected, we had to fight to get it released. And then we had to fight to get it thrown in the bin. That battle continues to this day, but will benefit from the archive discoveries I've since made and discussed later on. Due to the service journey we had to suffer with the police and its failure to attend to the evidence we produced, we made a new complaint to the Office of the Police Ombudsman, but this time about modern policing and asked for a supplementary review to account for all this new evidence. In four and a half years, the Office of the Police Ombudsman has yet to complete that complaint or updated report and has apologised a number of times for its failures, so that is going to end in court as well. All of these failed historic investigations have yet to answer our simple requests for information and have ignored a mountain of new evidence which we have produced. 
All of the failed historic investigations alleged that the authorities did not know where the seat of the explosion was and did not connect the neighbouring gem bar as a target as it was alleged to have allegiances to the official IRA. All of the field investigations denied that there was any British Army presence in the area despite how militarised New Lodge was and how the British Army had been hunting for three prisoners that had escaped in the area two days before the attack. All of the field investigations sought to excuse the botched police investigation even though I had proved in my book that the police created the McGurk's bar lie and the head of the police lied to government about our loved ones. But the Attorney General has failed to offer us a new investigation and a new inquest despite this mountain of new evidence. That decision will be tested at judicial review now too. So we have been fighting running battles with every facet and organ of the state including even the British Ministry of Defence and National Archives and the Information Commissioner's Office. All the while though, since the publication of the book, we have still been fighting some magnificent historic information which is fed into the legal cases. Here's a review of just some of these from three British Army logs, including some startling new evidence. We've obviously been similarly bladed with ongoing information battles as well as the field investigations and long drawn out court cases. All these fit neatly with the British state and PSNI strategy for dealing with the legacy of the past in our country. Denial, delay and death. They deny guilt until they cannot any longer. They delay campaigns for as long as possible, even in costly court battles, and they hope that family campaigners go to their grave. We have lost half a dozen family members in as many years. Even if we are successful via freedom of information and public interest test, there is the ubiquitous assertion that crucial files are missing or weighted without explanation. My discovery of the Headquarters Northern Ireland files for December 1971 is a case in point. The request for very specific information resulted in a two-year battle with the British Ministry of Defence, National Archives and Information Commissioner's Office. Appeal and denial of appeal finally resulted in an information tribunal in London where I faced three barristers. Thanks to Rights Watch UK, I was lucky to have secured pro bono support from a top Freedom of Information Act barrister or I would not have been able to afford any of it. It was an important partial win for us but illustrative of what families have to endure. We secured 20 heavily redacted logs from a file of 350 plus pages. One serial proved that the British Army knew the bomb was placed outside the bar, so critical evidence which smashed what we had been told before. Nevertheless, other significant evidence was missing for the day of the McGurk's bar attack, or was withheld from us. Neither myself nor my team knew exactly why, as the legal arguments were held behind closed doors. Closing arguments were in public, but only summarised. The information was withheld for two reasons. Number one, national security as we expected. And number two, protection of an agent informer. This in itself was critical information, but we were stopped from accessing the detail. To put it into context, one of our lawyers estimated the cost to the public person fighting the release of information nearly 45 later at this stage. He conservatively estimated the cost in court time solicitors and barristers for the MOD TNA and ICO and 200 hours of MOD research and redaction time at a quarter of a million pound at least. But that one serial, that one log from thousands of logs was absolutely critical and that it proved the British military and Royal Ulster Constabulary knew where the seat of the explosion was. It proved that an ammunition technical officer or ATO revisiting the site the following morning was convinced that the bomb was placed in the entranceway as the area is cratered and clearly was the seat of the explosion, in his own words. This is a completely correct assessment by a British Army bomb expert but one that was hidden from the families and public. It was not for PR as was exclaimed in capitals so the critical information was to be kept secret and not published. Even the original inquest was not told about it as the state sought to bolster its own lies. The preceding ATO report to Brigade goes into more exact detail. The bomb was placed in the ground floor entrance at the corner of the building that faces the junction, exactly where the paper boy saw it placed. The PSNI, HET, Office of the Police Ombudsman never found this critical information and it completely overturns what each says about the location of the bomb as it proves that the bar was attacked, as witnessed 
and the people inside the bar were completely innocent. We were also informed by successive historical investigations that the British Army and RUC never considered that the Gem Bar was the original target for the bombers. The British Army actually raided and searched the Gem Bar less than 48 hours before the McGurk's Bar explosion. It screened all of the customers and arrested six of them for further questioning. The reason is simple as it appears in the British Tactical Headquarter Battalion logs I've just secured for the Resident Battalion, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers or 2 RRF. Brigade writes in military shorthand that the Gem Bar was the alleged headquarters of the 1st Battalion of the official IRA, located in North Belfast. The British military logs, a few minutes after the McGurk's Bar attack, then connect the Gem Bar to the explosion. The reason is redacted and may be more sinister. Or it may be as simple that they have hidden the name of Cahill Goulding as the British military in these files refer to the Goulding IRA for the officials and the Brady IRA for the provisionals, Brady being Roy O'Brady. This simple, obvious intelligence again overturns the assertions by the historic investigations by the likes of Historical Inquiries Team, PSNI and Police Ombudsman's Office. It also highlights the fact that British military intelligence considered the Gem Bar to be one of the most important official IRA targets in North Belfast and that it had targeted it two nights before the Loyalists of the UVF did. Why was it not being watched that Saturday night though? Especially as the British military were alerted to IRA bomb runs in the city centre for a second weekend in a row and still on high alert for escaped prisoners. Again, we were told by successive historical investigations that there were no British Army troops in the area save for those in Glenravel and those dealing with intercommunal trouble in the Spamount area of New Lodge. New files I have discovered overturns this. We had long contested how bombers could travel and wait at a bomb target without being stopped or seen by the British military at this particular time. Witnesses confirmed the news reports that the city centre area, especially the north side, was in lockdown due to the threat of IRA bombs and the search for escaped prisoners. Then the area went quiet and the bar was attacked. If we believe the confession of Robert James Campbell, they waited in the area to get at the gem bar but couldn't, no doubt because of witnesses at the door. They then made the fateful decision to drive around the corner and bomb the nearest pub, McGurk's Bar. After sitting there for an opportunity, they lit the bomb watched by a paper boy and escaped down George, Great George Street and across York Street. They then turned into a side street and abandoned the car. A car due to pick Campbell up, drove by the bombers and got off side. The three then walked to the second pickup across Great Patrick Street, close to St Anne's Cathedral. Successive investigations categorically said that there was no British Army in the area to report on the car or the bombers, so they easily escaped even though they abandoned the car a few hundred yards away. The files I found have now demolished that. There's a reference in them to a new vehicle checkpoint operation called Closed Door, deployed an hour and three quarters before the explosion. Closed Door was ordered by 39 Brigade to produce an inner ring of VCPs to establish control of Irish Catholic West Belfast. There was no trouble in West Belfast at the time to warrant control of West Belfast unless the deployment is reasoned elsewhere. The logs actually record trouble in the north side of the city where the British Army were still looking for escapees. From the map of closed door locations I have, this does indeed place a VCP stranglehold on Irish Catholic West Belfast but leaves two main arterial routes in or skirting West Belfast free, both in Protestant areas leading into town, Shankill Road and the Crumlin Road. Around this time, Campbell was being tasked to a bomb team in the Orange Hall on the Shanker Road, so they would have had a clear run in. Could be coincidental or circumstantial, but definitely fortuitous for a bomb team with no scout car. What it does prove is that again I've been able to find potentially crucial evidence to support the families and witnesses in British military files which were completely missed by state investigators. A VCP operation clamp was called the minutes after the explosion as warranted by a major incident. These files also record British military observation posts or OPs in the days leading up to the explosion. As contested for many years by the families, there were OPs in or on the high rise flats at the bottom of the new lodge, both sitting on top of the target gem bar and McGurk's bar. 
each on Church Churchill House and Artillery House reported on suspicious vehicles and incidents in the days before the attack. There was also a static OP at Unity Flats covering the bottom of the Shankill Road in St Peter's Hill. Interestingly too, signals come from Red KP9, which I had to search for in British military files. KP is key point and Red denotes an important electrical installation which needed protection from the British Army. Even when I checked my files and discovered the KP Red 9 was in Great Patrick Street and potentially manned by 8 British soldiers and 8 of McGurks, I still had to look for it as I never knew it existed. It was actually hidden in plain sight during the conflict and was an exceptionally important switch house and control room for the power of the city. It's the building housed in the Golden Thread Gallery today, close to where the bombers abandoned the car in 1971 and walked to St Anne's in sight of the OP. It will now be up to the British military to explain how or why they did not see anything the night of McGurk's Bar explosion or why these OPs were abandoned. I know where to find that information but the British Ministry of Defence has said that they cannot find the particular files. Nevertheless I am publishing here for the first time too the discovery of a covert British military ambush OP in the vicinity of McGurk's Bar. And it should be noted that we have long queried the existence of a covert British military operation in the area that night. Only that there was an accidental discharge at it a few hours before the explosion, we may not have known about it. It is partially redacted and did not get reported in the usual brigade logs as it should have been. This tells me the proper reporting procedure was not followed or brigade was informed by another channel such as the secret signal. I have asked the British Ministry of Defence for further information about the exact location in York Street for this offensive British military OP as it could have had sight of the target area and indeed escape route of the bombers. As an offensive operation was indeed expected that night, that would explain a military out of bounds or OOB for the area as we have again long argued. What that operation was is obviously essential. Who manned the ambush OP could be critical too. If it was the resident battalion to RRF, we might expect a call sign reporting it and a subsequent message to brigade from the battalion. None is given. This message is at company level to tactical headquarter level and redacted. The last surveillance intercept and ambush OP in the area was the night before using the MRF. So I have proved they were already deployed in the area around that time and working on similar operations with to RRF. Historic investigators had told our families for years that there were no British soldiers in the area at all and definitely no special forces. They were wrong. If we look at the map of the area you can see that the target Gem Bar and McGurk's Bar was overlooked by Churchill House and Artillery House. Glen Ravel and Unity are there too. The bomber sat in a strange car under the noses of the British military who were looking for suspicious vehicles and people in the aftermath of bomb warnings and escaped prisoners. The ambush OP is somewhere close by along York Street and potentially covering the same area and escape route. The car is then abandoned close to KP Red 9 and the bombers walk within sight of the OP. So after being told for nearly half a century that there were no British troops in the area, we now see that within half a kilometre the area is potentially surrounded by British military with a covert offensive British Army operation in the vicinity of McGurk's Bar. We now know too from these files that the British Army had indeed logged suspect cars in the area before and after the bomb explosion. We would expect that from OPs covering the area even if a British military out of bounds was in place to accommodate the ambush OP. The IUC on York Road reported a green cortina outside the police station minutes before. A green cortina is reported in the minutes after the bomb, driving in the same area. Two anonymous calls were made about a green cortina or Viva which looks similar in the minutes after the explosion. This is potentially the car which was supposed to pick up Campbell but fled the scene. The following morning, the British Army log information given to an officer at the scene by a local who didn't want to give his name. The information he gave about a two-tone car and the bomb matched what we later learned from the paperboy. Neither the inquest, the historic investigations, nor families were told of this corroborating evidence, which also named the target too. 
a number of absolutely critical files following the attack are missing. I queried this and the British Ministry of Defence has told me that it does not know what has happened to them. Nevertheless, if we look at the file before missing files which would have covered the sighting of a suspect vehicle and the escape of the bombers, we can make out the carbon imprint of the missing file beneath. Battalion headquarters and call sign 19 report immediately, which tells me that there was indeed overwatch of the area. You will also note the faded copy of a missing log sheet. And if you look above serial 40, you will discern missing serial 52 minutes after the explosion. Call sign 19, it appears, reports, quote, black car with headlights on went into the city centre with three. It ends behind the page we have. This suspect vehicle leaving the scene in the direction of the bomber's escape has never been made available to the families or historic investigators. The British Ministry of Defence alleges it has lost the file, but we have recovered this critical evidence nonetheless. I'd also expect to find out about the recovery of the abandoned vehicle in the missing files, which may be another reason why they are missing. We know of course that a car was recovered and examined, as we have this snippet of a fingerprint ledger, which tells us that two prints were recovered from the car used in explosion Great George Street. This car disappeared from the investigation and the inquest was not told about it. So, who lied and who created the McGurk's bar lie? What was its origin? I have tracked it back to within a few hours of the explosion and its origin lies in collusion between the British Army and Royal Ulster Constabulary. At 1am, just over four hours after the attack and before all of the victims had been identified, including my own grandmother, the brigade commander informed his staff and headquarters Northern Ireland that the RUC have a line that the bomb in the pub was a bomb designed to be used elsewhere, left in the pub to be picked up by the provisional IRA. Bomb went off and was a mistake. RUC press office have a line on it and I should deal with them. This we now know and they knew then was an egregious, heinous lie that attempted to criminalise innocent civilians. It is the reason why our families have had to fight and claw for scraps of truth and justice from the British table for nearly half a century. Who was the brigade commander though? Well, he was the same person who had revamped the British military's information and psyops units and had deployed the killer gang, the military reaction force, onto the streets of Belfast. It was the same person who wrote on the very day of the McGurk's Bar explosion, it is likely that having fined down the enemy organisations to the extent we have done, future successes will be increasingly hard to achieve from an operational point of view, unless we are able to make our own organisation very much more efficient. As you know, we are taking steps to do this in terms of building and developing the MRF and we are steadily improving the capability of Special Branch. His name was Brigadier Frank Kitson. So, General Sir Frank Kitson does indeed have his dirty fingerprints all over the McGurk's Bar cover-up. We have the proof. There it is. That's why we demand a new investigation which questions him under caution immediately and before he dies. His stature and his guilt and the guilt of the RUC tells you why the British state and the PSNI are fighting our families tooth and nail for even a semblance of truth and justice. This battle has taken a tremendous toll on all of our families, on their physical and mental health, and yet the British state is failing and we will prevail. My name is Kieran McArch. I am the grandson of John and Kathleen Irvine. Thank you very much for watching this short seminar and thank you very much to Fela and Fubble for giving me the opportunity to engage with your good selves. If you want to carry on this conversation, you can connect with me on www.mcgurksbar.com or on social media at McGurksBar. Thank you very much.